Okay, welcome everybody to uh, Idea to IPO, uh, how to negotiate with venture capitalists. I'm your speaker today. My name is Roger Royce. I'm with the law firm of Haynes Boone. I'm a corporate and tax partner working with emerging growth and venture capital. I'm gonna go ahead and post uh, in the chat my information so you can all track me down and look me up if you'd like to afterwards. And I would uh, uh, encourage everybody else to go ahead and post your information as well in the chat. Feel free to leave your LinkedIn URL. That may be the best way to find people. So again, this is ID to IPO, how to negotiate with venture capitalists. Uh, I'm going to speak for an hour today, one hour, uh, and then at the top of the hour, 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, we're going to open it up to Q&A. So if you have questions while I'm speaking, and I expect that you will, go ahead and put those questions in the Q&A box, uh, and I will get to them at the end of the hour. And we'll do a half hour of questions, and then I am off to the airport. So we're gonna end right on time. Now, um, uh, I will be circulating an email after this presentation with a copy of my slides, uh, a copy of the recording, copy of the recording, so you can listen to this at your leisure, or a link to the recording, we'll say, uh, on my YouTube channel, which you now have a link to in the chat. And I'll, I'm also going to send you, oops, let's see if I can get this, yeah, I'm going to send you a digital copy of my new book, 10,000 Startups, Legal Strategies for Startup Success. If you want a paper copy, you can buy this on BookBaby or Amazon but you'll get a free digital copy just for signing up and being here today. And if you like that one, you might wanna read my first book, Dead on Arrival, How to Avoid the Legal Mistakes That Could Kill Your Startup, which is about 10 years old. All right, so um, again, use the chat to talk to each other. Think of that as your virtual networking site. Um, yeah, thank you for the chat messages. Uh, don't chat me uh, questions, put that in the Q&A box. Now, if you are uh, tweeting today, go ahead and use hashtag idea to IPO. Now with that, this is the one time I do need you to chat me. I am going to share my screen. And I would like a confirmation on chat, not yet. But now, can you see, can you see my screen? You should see one title slide. Somebody say yes. Amy says yes. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Thank you. You know, I always have to check. I did this one time where I didn't ask and I got about 15 minutes in and 10 slides and nobody was looking at my screen. So again, how to negotiate with venture capitalists. If you were here last week, you heard me talk a lot about venture capital. In fact, you heard me do part two of venture capital investment, but we did not really get down to the negotiation part with venture capitalists. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I do have some prefatory material that we'll go through, uh, but hopefully we're gonna kind of get down into the meat of things and talk about some of the terms. But, by way of introduction, while we do that, and especially since people are still joining, <clears throat> I do want to talk a little bit about some of the things you need to know before you even go into a uh, venture capital negotiation. And by the way, I was just this morning uh, early, I was uh, listening to the, to the master class by Chris Voss, who wrote Never Split the Difference. It's a book on negotiation. And one of the things he notes is that uh, you never, you know, information is really key. What you really want is information. Uh, and the best way to have information is to be very prepared before you go into any interaction, especially a negotiation. So <clears throat> what we're going to talk a lot about before we get into actual terms is how to get that information. Here's some straight talk for you from a famous VC or Andy Komisar, avoid venture capital unless you absolutely need it. That is my disclaimer that I'm giving you here today on top of my typical legal disclaimer that uh, what I'm providing to you is not legal advice. I'm just giving you my opinion. If you want legal advice, uh, you'll have to talk to me personally because your circumstances could differ. Same with Randy, I guess. Uh, you know, Not everybody is a candidate for venture capital. If you were here last week, you heard who is a candidate and who is not. Let me just recap that for you. Um, why, whether you should or should not take venture capital. So know this before you even before you even approach a VC. Just keep in mind, you know that money costs a lot. It's very expensive. 
right? What do I mean by that? I mean, you typically have to give up equity. You always have to give up equity when you talk to a VC. And if your company does really well, that is very expensive money, okay? Uh, a good company that, uh, or a company that is a good candidate for venture capital probably doesn't have a lot of near-term cash flow. We talked about that last week. Why is that? Well, that's because if they do have near-term cash flow, they will use debt financing, which is way cheaper than venture financing. Uh, usually it's companies that have, you know, tremendously high potential for growth, but also a lot of risk are candidates that are, are companies that are going to be candidates for venture capital. They're risky, they're illiquid. Um, sometimes that's a good thing, by the way. We're seeing the volatility in the stock market right now. Uh, it's probably a good thing that startups are illiquid. It's probably a pretty attractive investment right now uh, just to uh, avoid all that volatility. Uh, in fact, it's a good place to put your money. And by the way, uh, we talked about this during the last two sessions. There is a tremendous amount, a tremendous amount of venture capital in the system right now. I am seeing companies get funded now that have not been able to talk to an institutional investor in 10 years. I'm not making this up. And more than one, they've been beating on doors for 10 years and have not been able to get venture money. Now all of a sudden they've gotten way better looking, right? And they're getting that and they're they're getting term sheets. It's a tremendous amount of money in the system. There has never been a better time. Can that business scale? This is probably the number one biggest thing. A VC does not want to invest in a business that's going to give them a modest return and maybe a little bit of a dividend and a nice lifestyle for somebody. They want a business that a company that is going to experience explosive growth or has that potential. Now, I put huge market in here, but um, people don't like it because that's not quite right. And instead of huge market, I should say huge potential because you can be in a small market. You can be in a market that doesn't even exist yet. In fact, that's oftentimes what VCs love to invest in. Just has to be a company that has the potential to be a big company. For those of you joining late, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A box. I'm going to get to the questions at the end of the presentation. So think about that. You know, Are you that kind of company? It's what I call a go big or go home company. You either need venture capital to succeed, and if you get it, and if you succeed, you will be a big change the world, humongous success, or you don't. You're gonna get the profitability pretty quickly, but you're limited on how, how big you're going to grow. We have a whole presentation on how to figure out which one you are and what to do as a legal matter if you're not quite sure if you could go both ways. But for now, we're focused on you, the companies that really think you're gonna be good candidates for venture capital. Now, before we get too far into this, I also want to talk talked about what you should be. I want to talk about what money you should take. Think about investor goals, right? Think about how cooperative this investor is. And by the way, VCs have reputations, right? And here in the information age, it's not hard to find at all. You know, you do a quick Google, Google search and you'll not only VCs, but angels, you'll find out as much as you want to know about them. You can find out what they're like. Are they cooperative? Are they accessible? You know, are they going to be close to you? They're going to be able to show up at board meetings, provide you with that kind of advice. Let me pause on this for a second. You know, venture money is the opposite of dumb money. Okay. Venture money is the money that you take, not because it's green, you know, or not only because it's green if you're in the US, but also because of the contacts and all of the expertise and the potential pipeline and everything you're getting with that. In fact, that is the definition of a venture capital strategy is that the VC is going to take a pretty active role in the management of your business. So knowing that, you know, you want to have the right VC for you, uh, but you also want to have somebody you can work with. We'll talk more about that in a minute. How much, you know, do they demand control? Uh, what have the, what have their past deals been like? And of course, think about terms and valuation, which is what most of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be about. Think about which VC you want to approach, right? And um, 
here's some categories that you might, some people break it down in these sort of categories. Thematic investors looking for what's next. Uh, I can think of people like that whenever I call them up and say, hey, I got a company for you. They say, well, it's got to be really different. You know, I want something really different and really cool. And, you know, they're, they're very much what is the next big thing kind of people. Uh, domain investors might be just the opposite. They're focused on an industry that they know well. And we do plenty of presentations around that here at ID to IPO. Um, we just did one on space tech. We've done many on agriculture technology, health technology, et cetera, but FinTech, energy tech uh, in particular. Um, usually the, the, the distinction comes down, or traditionally, I should say, the distinction comes down to between investors who really look at the team or investors who really look at the technology. And there are different kinds out there. And think of the people investors, and one way of looking at it is, are they betting on the jockey or the horse? Um, I heard um, um, uh, Bill Draper famously say that he's more of a people investor. He bets on the team, while uh, Jurvetson, his former partner, maybe current partner, um, probably bets a little bit more on the tech. So there you have two VCs in the same firm. One's looking more at the team, one's looking more at the technology. Okay, a few basic principles. Again, be prepared, know who, what you're going into. So, so think about this before you even go into these discussions. Um, generally, just as a general rule, your investors are your partners, okay? Um, they're not, um, they may be more passive than others, but as a general rule, once you take on an investor, you're really married to that investor. Uh, and you're often, uh, it's often a marriage with no divorce. You're gonna be with that investor till the end of the company. That is especially true with venture capitalists. Because as I said, they're not gonna be passive, right? They're gonna be very concerned about getting information and taking a role, uh, usually on your board of directors, which we will talk about in a minute. But just have to keep that in mind, you know, when you're, doing business with the VC, you're taking on a partner. Secondly, I'd like you to keep in mind the concept of staging your financing. And sophisticated entrepreneurs and sophisticated investors understand this. They understand this very, very well. You only take as much money as you need to get to the next valuation metric. And my rule of thumb is that, gee, we'd like it to be maybe two years and two X multiple, okay? So we'd like to have enough money that gets us two years out so we're not constantly in fundraising mode. And we'd like it, that money to get us to some metric, an FDA approval, a product la launch, a tape out, whatever it is that causes our valuation to take a big bump, ideally twice as much. And in fact, a lot of VCs will just plan it that way and look for it that way and even engineer it that way by pumping money into marketing to increase sales, to bump up your valuation. More about that later. But for now, just stage your financing. You don't take a penny more than you need. Um, and uh, if, if you're doing things right, you know, you are, you are actually turning people away. You're turning them down and say, look, the round is full. Don't need or want your money, sorry. Keep in mind that venture funding is dilutive. There are other types of funding that are not, right? You could do a crowdfunding on Kickstarter. You could do a government grant, um, which by the way, there's a lot of grant money in the system these days too. It's another presentation. Um, you could do um, sales, revenues, it's all non-dilutive. Venture money is dilutive. You're going to decrease your interest. My rule of thumb, is I would like you, the founders, to maintain control at the close of your Series A, but you probably won't at the close of Series B. We'll talk more about what that means, um, but your funding is going to result in you having a smaller percentage of the company. Uh, I like to plan into it and back into it from at least Series B on back, but just keep in mind that's what's going to happen. Okay, you know, I'm going to see a few more people joined us. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop into the chat, my contact information. So everybody knows how to find me. 
Um, valuation. You know, I'll talk more about valuation perhaps later, but let's pause on that now because that's what everybody is so concerned about when they go into a negotiation and they start comparing um, term sheets. If you're a lucky, in a lucky enough position to have more than one term sheet, which you would like to be, by the way. If you've done this right, you will have more than one competing term sheet. So the first number everyone looks at is evaluation. Not your biggest issue, okay? Certainly it's important, but it's probably not your biggest issue. You gotta read the fine print. And I can tell you lots of stories about people getting big valuations on the one end, but it taketh away on the back end through the preferred stock terms. Uh, Anti-dilution rights, uh, participation, preferences, multiples of preferences, et cetera. So, so think of it this way, that's just one metric. You really got to do the numbers and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute and do the what ifs, what happens in an exit? What does that valuation really mean? Secondly, so that's one reason you should get too hung up on valuation. The second thing is, is you got to get over it. It's, it's not, get, you know, it's not an ego issue. Valuation is not what you're worth, it's not as a company and certainly not as a person. <laughs> Your valuation really is what the VC is thinking, what sort of return they need on the back end, what that means in terms of what you're likely to scale if everything goes well, and what that means in terms of how much money you need now to get to where they need it on the back end. It's just a mathematical calculation. Now, I said that in a way that might give you the idea that VCs are, are sitting around with calculators and Excel spreadsheets figuring out what you're worth. It's usually not how it's done. Um, usually how it's done. And by the way, I have a whole memo on this if you want to read all about it. Usually how it's done is through much more rough justice measures, which surprisingly will come out about the same across the board, across multiple investors. Uh, but theoretically, it should be a number that present values them to something really big down the road, uh, you know, statistically speaking, over a large enough sample. But oftentimes, what it might be is that you need X dollars to get to your next valuation metric. Uh, the VC needs Y percent of your company. Poof, Z equals your valuation. It's just that's the formula. Doesn't have a lot to do with what you're worth. It has a lot to do with how much money you need uh, and how much money it takes for you to scale. Avoid early mistakes. Super easy to make a mistake these days. You can go on an online uh, do-it-yourself legal resources site and just screw up your company. Um, most of the time we can fix that. Any lawyer can correct any mistakes that you've made, any I's you forgot to dot or T's you forgot to cross. Sometimes you can't, and I'll just warn you, sometimes you can't. Um, I've had it happen. I've had people come in my office where they had converted their non-taxable foreign intellectual property into taxable USIP through an online service. It was just too late. We can't fix that. That's just what you're stuck with now. So just keep that in mind uh, that you'd like to avoid those mistakes. And you're doing the right thing by coming to presentations like this, reading books like this, and understanding what those early mistakes are so you can avoid them. Cheap money over expensive money. Um, we talked about that a little earlier. That really go, gets to the terms that you're giving up when you take that money. And a couple more practical things that are not really basic principles, but I got to say them anyway. Uh, you sell preferred stock to investors. You sell common stock to service providers. Don't violate that rule, okay? It'll mess up your cap table if you do. It'll result in your common stock being priced too high for the service providers to want it, and the investors having too big a percent of your company that you should not have given away, and you would not have if you've used preferred stock. Get a data room uh, and take your own personal ownership for populating it. So when the VC does come knocking, you're able to provide that diligence immediately. And do and speaking of diligence, get all your cleanup done ahead of time. If you're sitting in this presentation listening to me now, just know this, mistakes are free right now. We're pretty darn cheap. We can fix almost anything you've done, almost, not everything. Not everything, but almost everything. So fix it before you talk to the VC because they're free now. Once you're in discussions with an investor or an acquirer, mistakes cost money. 
because they will cause delay. They might cost you valuation points. They're certainly going to hurt your credibility and it might cause the investor to walk away from the deal. Okay, so you should understand a little bit about venture capital economics before you even approach a venture capitalist, right? Understand what they're thinking, what's going on in their head, on their side of the table. Uh, what are their pressures and their stressors? Well, let me kind of lay it out for you. First of all, typical VC fund has a two to two and a half percent management fee per year on committed capital that the general partner receives. That's the person who manages the fund. Because a VC, that's a pooled investment vehicle, they're managing other people's money and they're getting paid for that. And that management fee, at the end of the day, it's gonna probably make up more than half their return on the entire investment, uh, uh, of the entire amount that they receive from the fund. So two to two and a half percent management fee right off the top. Let me just be clear. So if we have a hundred million dollar fund, 2%, 2 percent, two million to two and a half million dollars a year goes out the door immediately to the general partner for managing the fund. And keep in mind, the VC is thinking about getting a return to his investor. He wants a really strong IRR. It's called internal rate of return. Secondly, typical fund has a 20% carried interest. That means that 20% of the gains that that VC, that venture fund makes on its investments goes to the general partner. Again, right out the door, 20%. So the limited partners are getting, you know, only 80% of the gains, uh, less uh, that management fee. Now, sometimes we allocate the management fee to the carried interest. I have a whole hour on how venture capital funds work, but for the most part, um, there's a big nut they got to cover right from the start before the LPs are going to make much money on this. So what does that mean if we crank the numbers and go through all the math? Our LPs are expecting three times their money back from this venture fund. That's what they've been promised. That's what they want. That's what a 30% annualized rate of return works out to over a 10-year term. That means that VC fund is going to have to give them three or four times our investment to return that amount. So that's a lot of money, right? They have a, you know, they have to have really big economics. They have to do really well to meet those promises. Well, how do they do, right? Well, half of them lose money historically. Just expect that. I mean, half of the investments that they make, sorry, lose money. They just expect that. They're high risk investments. 20 to 30% um, are gonna return their money or maybe give them twice their money. Still not where we need to be, right? The rest of them have to be what we call home runs. They have to be big, big hits, 10 to 100 times their money. And that happens. There are funds that have made it on one investment. And in fact, if you think about it, suppose you got a venture fund. Let's use a small fund. It's $10 million. It makes 10 investments of 1 million each. Um, if one of them generates 100 times its money, how well do the rest of them have to do in order for that venture capital fund to return to its investors its promise? And the answer is it doesn't matter. They could all fail. We just need that one. So they're all looking for that one. So when you go talk to the VC, keep that in mind. They're looking for that home run. So you need to convince them that you're not that single. You're not that double. You're not the company that will someday be worth $10 million. You're the company that will someday be worth a billion dollars. That's what they're looking for. Now, are you a fit? So remember what I said, they wanna know there's a large potential market, meaning that your company can be a large company. It helps if you're a first mover or first to market. They're not always necessary, right? Just look around, you know, it's oftentimes not the first mover that takes the market. Um, they're definitely looking at long-term scale over short-term profits. In fact, I've sat in enough of these meetings where I've heard the VC said, oh, no, wait a minute, we don't want to do that pay model just yet because we don't want to be profitable. We don't want your company to pay taxes now. We want you to generate a bunch of losses, build a big asset, scale it, and then we can sell it for lots of money and, and all, all get rich. As we talked about, it's typically a company that doesn't have uh, enough cash flow to service debt. Again, because you're reinvesting all that cash flow. 
And um, finally, big, big word, traction. You got to show traction as a general rule. Now, I've seen companies not so much lately, maybe, well, not so much in the last you know, 20 years, uh, but uh, uh, lately I'm hearing more about it where some serial entrepreneur who's been very successful goes in with a PowerPoint and gets venture money. Usually that's not how it works. There's just too many good companies out there now. The quality of startups has gone up so high um, that they're gonna wanna see traction. And what I mean by that is the idea that a company can actually get users, that it can get customers. Revenue is the best form of traction. It doesn't have to be revenue. You just need to show that people will actually pay for your service. That's what they typically wanna see. But traction can mean different things in different industries. So that's one metric. I'll leave that to the venture capital advisors. A little bit more about venture capital economics, getting inside the minds of the people that you're negotiating with. Um, we talked about the economics, talk about management. As I said, they are going to participate in your management. What does that mean? In your A round, you're gonna give up at least one of three seats, one of three board seats to the venture capitalist, right? That means they're gonna sit on your board and they're going to uh, take an active role in your management as a board member. If you have more than one VC in the round, maybe it's what we call a party round, uh, and oftentimes you will, uh, you won't have enough board seats, but they wanna have a seat at the table, they'll get what they call a board observer right. Observer right means that they don't have a vote in those board meetings, but they actually can be in the meetings and they can observe and they can provide content. Uh, a management rights letter just gives, a, it's a letter that gives them managerial rights. It's required um, for securities law purposes. Keep in mind uh, that a, a venture fund lasts uh, seven to 10 years. It takes that long for a company to exit these days um, of venture capitalists. And this is important. They've only got so much money. They've only got so big a team. They have to take an active role in your company. That means that they only have so much time to spend on so many companies. That means they can only invest in a limited number of companies. It, what I'm getting to is it means they don't make small investments. They need to make bigger investments to deploy all their capital and manage it meaningfully. So keep that in mind too, what their economics are when it comes to how much they can manage. Um, we talked about this. Um, they're gonna look for expertise. They're gonna look for technology. They're gonna look for how big your company can be. Just keep in mind um, here in Silicon Valley, where I practice in Palo Alto, everybody talks forever about the role of a technical co-founder and how important technical expertise is. You know, domain expertise is just as important in my mind. And what I mean by that is that people who understand the business, the market and the industry right? Otherwise, you end up having a lot of companies building products that solve problems that don't exist, right? You want somebody who really understands the pain points in the enterprise. It's great if you can have a co-founder that can have domain expertise. If not, you'll have to go out and use advisors. But just keep that in mind. It would be a much better year pitch if you can show that to the VC. Again, before you pick the VC, uh, we're going to get into terms in a, in a minute here, but first, reputation, just Google it. Secondly, how likely are they to close, right? You might want to know that before you even go into that discussion. Some VCs, if you get a term sheet, you're going to close, and we all know who they are. Others, not so clear, right? And I've been in those deals where you negotiate all the documents and spend three months at it. Uh, you argue back and forth over every little point, you get down to the signing, and then you get that email, we changed our mind, we're not going to close. That happens. You don't want that to happen to you. That happens to you, you got to start all over, and you've been out of the market for 90 days, uh, typically. Uh, what stage of the fund are they at? Or what stage of fund are they? So in other words, uh, what do they invest in? How big are they? Do they invest in startups? Do they invest in seed? Do they invest in series A? Do they invest in later stage? You want to know that before you talk to them. Size of the fund, how big are they? That's important because you'll want to know how much money they have to do follow on investments, right? How early are they in the fund, right? If it's a 
you know, if they're, if they're coming up on 10 years, you know, they're not going to be around much longer. One, they might be pushing you to exit before you want to. And two, they're not going to be there to put more money in to do a follow on round, which sends a really bad signal to the market sometimes. So if they are about to wind up their fund, Hopefully they have a fund two, a fund three, a fund four waiting in the background that the same managers will be in charge of so that they can prop up your investment to say it another way. Are they litigious? Um, here in Silicon Valley, not so much. People have learned their lesson. Uh, you go to court, the market punishes you for doing that. Um, you know, People just have to be adults and have to understand that sometimes you lose your money. Sometimes things don't work out. Um, some investors are not like that, right? They want to be litigious. Don't, if you don't remember anything I've said today, remember this. Don't do business with litigious people. Just don't do it. You're going to regret it. Uh, I'm a lawyer and I can tell you, I've seen it firsthand. Uh, I won't do business personally with litigious people because I know how miserable they can make your lives. Anybody with $2,500 can go down to the courthouse and create a public record of all sorts of spurious allegations. So check the public records. Like I say, here in Silicon Valley, you don't find litigious VCs. They know better, right? You know, so remember that you'll never work in this town again. By the way, the same goes for you. You don't want to be that guy either, right? Or that person uh, that gets a reputation for being a troublemaker. And I've seen both of them. Eventually, you know, no one will do business with you. And then finally, Make sure you're dealing with a decision maker. Um, and by decision maker, uh, you know what I mean. You're probably not gonna start with a partner when you talk to the VC. You'll start somewhere else with other people that screen you. But eventually you wanna get to the person that can make that decision uh, as soon as you can. As quickly as time kills deals, time kills deals. So the more quickly you can get, you know, can reduce the time and get to the decision maker, the more likely your chances of success. I'll just say one thing about VC fit. You know, personalities are important. Are important. Um, when you get the slides, you'll get a hyperlink to this email that was published online from the CEO of Circle Up to an investor uh, for a very uh, long emotive uh, example of a VC founder relationship that did not go so well. You don't want to be that guy either. All right, um, you know, I'm gonna, given the time, I wanna jump into a few things here, uh, but I do wanna say, well, let me just close on the VC fit part by saying, keep in mind that, uh, again, company VC fit, they tend to be capital intensive businesses, right? You really need money to scale, right? You're not a company that's gonna develop an IP and then license it. That's not a VC fit. I mean, I, ta I, you know, I talk a lot about that. Um, I especially talk about it in my books. Uh, you want to be a company that's going to build a product, a capital intensive business, because the returns are so much higher, potential returns. If you're not capital intensive, you're simply building an idea and then licensing it, your returns are capped. Um, think about whether that VC is follow on funding. Um, think about how long they're going to be around if they're, they're going to give you sufficient time to exit. So VC, these days, you know, you find funds that call themselves VC funds, maybe they're angel funds, I don't know, but institutions are investing in something way more than Series A. And what used to be Series A became Series C, then it became Pre-Seed, and then it became Series A1 and A2. Um, so don't get too hung up on these labels, but everybody does, you know, just, just like the perception, because they want Series A at the point that oh, we're, we got traction and we're scaling. We don't have traction. Gosh, we can't sell Series A and I can't buy Series A, so we're going to call you pre-seed. Yeah, whatever, you know, uh, how, whatever labels you want to put on it, it'd be good to know that your VC is okay investing in companies that are at the stage you're at. That's all I want to say by that more than the labels. And again, you find all sorts of funds these days. A micro VC is really just a group, just an angel using other people's money. Uh, there are seed stage funds, it's early, mid stage, series B and beyond, of course, late. You'll find a lead uh, venture capitalist, and this is uh, 
this is significant, you'll typically negotiate your term sheet with one party, one VC. There might be a half dozen of them in the deal, but you're gonna negotiate with one and you're gonna come down to a term sheet and others will follow that lead. There might be a co-lead, but you're gonna you know, find one cowbell investor and you're, so everyone's gonna follow that investor. Sometimes you'll do the opposites, what they call a party round. You have a bunch of people in the deal, but still they'll speak with one voice. Uh, when you do go into a deal, first of all, you gotta have your lawyer. You know, Don't try this at home, folks, have a lawyer. Secondly, I like to get a CPA involved. Not many people do that, but I do, because if you're going to lose your NOLs or if uh, some other bad, if you're gonna have a parachute payment, uh, what they call 280G payments, whatever it is, if you're gonna have a change of control, or if there's any bad consequences, we wanna know about it. Secondly, and more importantly, you are going to have to stand behind your numbers uh, when you present financials to a VC. Now here in early stage land where I practice, everybody understands that numbers are probably not quite necessarily exactly GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. We all kind of get that. And we all understand that we can't take those numbers to the bank. Once you start talking to VCs, they need to know that there's nothing, there's no material differences. There's no huge mistakes. You haven't been booking revenue you didn't earn for example, stuff like that. And once you do take the VC, you're gonna to have to up your game in terms of financial reporting. Usually they're going to require audited financial statements that does require a CPA. Clean that up earlier rather than later, avoid the surprises. I could tell you stories about things that we found um, in the financials uh, that created real problems. Uh, rarely see finders, bankers or brokers in a venture capital deal. Uh, you'll see them in private equity probably, but rarely in a venture deal. Um, mentors and advisors, uh, sometimes they can add value. Hopefully they brought you to that investor if it's a good advisor. Strategic venture capital, I'll pause on that for a minute. That's a little bit different. Um, think about that as, uh, so, so when I talk about venture capital, I typically mean a financial investor, right? They're investing for the return. Well, they know your industry and they've invested in the space before and they know everybody and they're gonna do follow on and all of that stuff and introduce you to investment bankers. But strategic means of corporate, they're there because they want something more than just the financial return. Um, they might want to acquire you down the road. They might want a license. They might want a supply agreement. They want something else from you. Uh, and they both, they're in your industry or some related industry so they're investing in you for that strategic purpose. That's a lot different. So if you're doing strategic venture capital, it's a different kind of deal, different kind of investor. And the two things I'll say about that is number one, don't expect a strategic to take the kind of role in management that a VC will. In fact, the complaint that I always hear is we can't get their attention. We can't get them to show up at meetings. They won't sign documents. They change, you know, internally all the time. I lost my champion. You know, they don't support us. You know, it's really annoying. They won't sign. They got all these blocking rights and they won't waive them. Just keep that in mind. You know, when you talk to strategics, make sure you're very clear about what their succession is. And secondly, they almost always want some sort of right of first refusal, right of first look, or right of first offer to buy your company. Uh, we'll negotiate that down and water it down. Hopefully I can talk more about that. But those are really the two big differences. Um, we've talked about this in other presentations. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it given that I'm not even through half my slides yet. Just keep in mind, you're gonna be a Delaware C corporation when you go to the venture capital. You can have some debt on your balance sheet. You can have some convertible debt. You can have warrants. Your option pool is gonna get way bigger in your VC round. Trust me, that's usually how it happens. Uh, but the, the important thing is that you look a certain way, both in terms of your business model, which is somebody else's department, or in terms of your legal structure, which is my department. VCs are gonna want you to be a Delaware C Corp because a lot of them are still relying on qualified small business stock, right? And remember what that is from last week? 
That is the idea that an investor can exclude up to $10 million or 10 times their cost, whatever is greater, $10 million of gain from federal income tax if they buy qualified small business stock. So they are typically going to want you to be one, a qualified small business. So you can issue qualified small business stock. And 99% of the time, you will easily meet that standard as long as you don't mess up on a few things. So be careful about that. By the way, the one big thing people mess up on, that, on this is redemptions. If you redeem too much stock from your shareholders, you're going to lose that QSB status. So be super careful about that. By the way, when might you redeem too much stock from your investors? Secondaries, right? Sometimes people want to take money off the table by having a redemption of their shares. Um, so you have to be you have to plan into this. Again, good to have a CPA on board, you know, to alert you to these things before they happen. Um, they're not going to invest in an LLC. You're going to have to be a corporation. Just trust me on this one. Uh, read my book if you want to know why. Um, but there are two good reasons there. All right, let's talk about term sheets. We already talked about valuation. That'll be the number one thing that jumps out at you from the term sheet. And that's a good place to start. That's not where you want to end. Valuation is one issue. How much are they valuing you? And I've told you already how they're coming up with their numbers and what that means. Let's not end there. Let's go on. The next thing that you should look at would probably be the participation. So these days, um, I only see what we call 1x non-participating convertible preferred stock. Let me tell you what that means. It means when the investor puts their money in, the 1x means they have a liquidation preference of one times their money. So if you sell their, your company, they get their one times their money back before you the come and get anything. But then that's all they get if it's non-participating. If it's participating, they get their one times their money back, plus they get their pro rata percentage of everything else. I never see participating preferred stock anymore. No, not never, rarely, rarely. If I do see it, it's going to be capped. It's like, okay, Mr. VC, you get your 1x back, but, and then you get your pro rata percentage. You bought 10% of the stocks for a million dollars. So you get a million dollars plus 10% of the return, but we cap it at two or three times the money you put in. Sometimes I'll see that. Not anymore, but I used to. Uh, and then the cap. If you do have participation, you'll have a cap. So usually it's non-participating, meaning, meaning you either get your money back or you get your percentage. Now there could be 2x. Doesn't have to be 1x non-participating, which would mean you either get two times your money back or your pro rata percentage. These days, it's always 1x non-participating convertible preferred. What's the convertible mean? It means the preferred converts into common. And by converting into common, it just takes its pro rata share. All right. By the way, on conversion, uh, that'll happen automatically when you do an IPO. It'll also happen if there's a majority vote. Why would that ever happen? Why would the VCs ever get together and, and just vote to convert their stock to common? which has no more preferences. We'll talk about that later. We've talked about it before. If you have a troubled company, we need to do some sort of cram down. We need to recap the company uh, in order that to make it attractive to future investors. That might have to happen. And the VC wants to control that decision since it's, they're the only ones who get affected by it. Dividends, uh, the preferred will have a dividend preference in um, technology startups that is pretty much meaningless because it is, always, it is always what we call a non-cumulative dividend. That means that the VC gets their dividend before anybody else, uh, only if a dividend is declared and as it's declared. And I can count on two fingers the number of times I've had companies declare dividends. I can count on zero fingers the number of times I've seen a venture-backed startup declare a dividend. Just doesn't happen. So let's not get too hung up on it. We don't even have to talk about cumulative dividends. The liquidation preference I already talked about. Here is the example I went through, so you can see it again. One million dollars gets invested for ten percent. Suppose we have a sale of the company for five million dollars. Well, I have one X non-participating preferred. Let's see. 
I can take my million dollars back or I can take my 10% back. Hmm, let me think. 10% uh, of 5 million is 500,000, even though I forgot a zero on the slide. Let's see, 500,000 is less than a million. I think I'll take my million. All right, that's the liquidation preference. However, what happens if there's a sale for $20 million? Let me think. Uh, $1 million is less than 10% of 2 million. 2 million is 10% of 20 million. I'll take, I'll convert and I'll take my common stock. And, and, and by the way, the way the provisions are usually drafted is that you used to have to actually 20 years ago, we used to have to affirmatively convert to common, which could be really tricky in close calls, like when there's earnouts. Now, the way provisions are drafted is the preferred stock investor, the VC, they get the greater of, so they don't really have that problem. All right, we're almost halfway through. <laughs> We've got 10 minutes left. Board representation. A VC is going to want a seat on the board. Your board should be three members, um, three members as of uh, your Series A round. Sometimes it's five, so don't freak out if it's five. Understand that someone's going to have to come off, off that board when you do your Series B. And by the way, if you have a three-member board before you do your Series A, someone's going to have to come off that board probably when you do your Series A, unless you go to five. Why am I saying three and five and not four, right? Can anyone guess? Yeah, you do not want a deadlock. You do not want a potential for deadlock on your board. That's a real problem. So always make it an odd number. And again, these, everything I say, whenever I say always, I mean almost always, because you see exceptions to these rules all the time. Founder-friendly board is one I would define as where the VC has one, the founder has one, and then uh, the common stock gets to an, uh, select the third one. Usually that's not how it happens. It's an, the VC and the founder will get together and find an industry luminary that they will jointly select to be the third board member. By the way, you always have to assume that you do not have a disinterested board, and we won't get to that today, but sometimes it's important to approve certain transactions. You would like a disinterested board. You always have to assume that they're not disinterested just because of the way VC back company boards are put together, because the VC always has a tremendous amount of influence over even the board members that they don't select. And you always have to assume that those board members somehow feel a little beholden to that VC and is probably not disinterested. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that's how it'll play out in a lawsuit. I'm just saying for purposes of planning and taking certain actions, you should just assume that it, it'll um, just belt and suspenders cautionary tale. What does the board of directors do? They manage the company. Of course, they're responsible for overseeing the day-to-day -day business of the company by selecting officers. What do observers do? Um, observers, they just observe, they weigh in, they offer their input. I've been to board meetings with VC observers on and you thought the VC observer, you know, I had 100% of the board seats, all they did was talk. Um, but that's what you gotta live with, you know, when you give an observer seat. Um, you will always give the board members indemnification. That means the company will pay for any cost if they get sued because they're a board member. Um, you will also wanna back that up with insurance. These days, no board member should not have insurance. You've got to have that, especially if you're in a crazy litigious state like California. You know, you need to have insurance and the board member needs to know the company is gonna pay if they get sued just by virtue of the fact they're sitting on your board. And you want to imagine how bad it can be just looking at papers and see some of the big lawsuits that are going on right now down in San Jose. And tell you what, if I were a board member on that company, which shall go unknown, I'd be shaking in my boots right now. Protective provisions. Um, that's the other thing the VC will ask for. Um, they're going to want what is basically a veto right. Sometimes it's a class vote, or sometimes it's a majority vote. The class vote means they, as a class, the venture capitalists owning the preferred stock have to approve certain decisions. A majority vote means that everybody voting together has to have a majority to approve a decision. All right, <clears throat> Delaware law allows you to abrogate class vote and do majority vote. 
It's one of the reasons we always form in Delaware. So we can have a set of, um, of uh, governance documents, certificate of incorporation, that basically says it requires a majority of the common and preferred voting together to approve a merger. Couldn't do that in California. You'd have to give the preferred uh, a vote on that merger and the common a vote on that merger. Here's some standard protective provisions. You can expect the VC to ask for a right to veto a sale of the company, uh, amendment to the certificate, the, the issuance of shares that are um, that rank ahead of, of, of the shares that they have, uh, redemptions, of course, paying dividends, changing the number of directors, etc. And then on the other column is stuff that they often ask for, but not always, kind of depends on the VC. You can read about that later. Let's move on. You're going to have to give financial statements. You'll be surprised. This really shocks a lot of first-time entrepreneurs just how much financial information they have to come up with. Remember what I said, get that VC. What I would caution you is that uh, you only provide those financials and that information to investors who reach certain thresholds that put in a certain amount of money. Um, it's, a, it's a burden, no doubt about it. Registration rights is a right that the investor asks for to be able to require the company to go public in effect so that they can get liquidity. Um, it's always in a VC deal. I've never once in my entire long career seen anybody exercise a registration right, so I'm not gonna talk much about it. Transfer restrictions. Um, they're gonna want first a right to buy any shares that you, the founder, decide to sell. Uh, you have to offer it back to the company first. And if the company doesn't buy it, then the investors should have a right to buy your shares before you can sell them to a third party at the same price. And if all the investors don't have that right, we usually see what we call a gobble up right, which means that the investors who do elect to buy shares can buy those shares. So eventually, it's also called a right of over allotment. Eventually, the investors can get all of the shares and you can't sell those shares to any other third party. Just expect that it's standard. The best you can do is to ask for a carve out and say, could you give me a 5% carve out so I can sell some shares free of the first right of first refusal. And why do you care? Because that right of first refusal really chills any third party offers. It's hard to do a secondary sale if the company is not gonna waive that or if they're not gonna let you sell to any third party. And that means the price is gonna be artificially depressed. Co-sale and tag along. A co-sale is a right to participate in a sale. So if you, the founder, find someone that wants to buy your shares, you can sell them, but um, you have to let the VC participate in that sale and sell some of their shares in the same sale effectively. Mechanically, it doesn't quite work that way, but that's effectively how you come out. The drag along is the flip side of that. That's where the investors can force you, the founders, to sell your shares. They found a buyer for theirs. The buyer wants 100% of the stock. They can force you contractually to sell your shares in that drag along. All right. Founder vesting. Um, this is also a negotiated term in term sheets. Just expect that you're going to have to unvest your shares. Just expect that. You're fully vested. You've been there five years. You've earned them by God. But the VC comes along and says, look, we need to know you're going to stick around. We're going to impose another three to five year vesting restriction. What does vesting mean? We all remember from last week, it's the idea that you earn into your shares. So I've got them, but if I quit working, you're gonna take them away from me, right? And the longer I work, the fewer you can take away. Five years vesting means at the end of five years, I will have on all five, you're all 100% of my shares, you can't take any. If I work a year and then quit, you take 80% because it's 20% a year. You get the idea. Um, we talked about triggers last time, but just keep in mind, your founder, they play a game here in Silicon Valley called fire the founder. Uh, just expect the founder is going to get fired, you know, unless you're Zuckerberg or somebody, um, you know, at some point in your round. When that happens, remember vesting, that means you lose all your shares. Well, that's a drag. So if you're a founder, what you want to do is you want to have a provision that says, if you get fired, you accelerate and vest in your shares. The VCs will not give that to you. What they may give to you, however, is a provision that says, if you get fired close in time or related to a sale of the company, 
then you get full vesting in your shares. We've talked about it before, so just a refresher. Pro rata rights, major investors, people who put enough money in your company are always gonna have a right to maintain their percentage. What a drag it would be if they bet on you early and you're a big winner and uh, you're such a big winner that everybody wants into your next round and the company's going up and up and up and you couldn't participate in that when you were an early supporter. So they will always have a right, a pro rata right, a right to maintain their percentage interest going forward. Expect to see that. And then finally, what you should look for, uh, just expect that your option plan is going to increase, okay? Now, an option plan, you have a reserve. When you set up your cap table, if you've done this properly, you've issued a certain number of shares to your founders, and then you've authorized enough shares and then reserve them for issuances later under your stock option plan. But because you didn't have any money, you couldn't put a stock option plan in place. You couldn't get an expensive valuation of your stock for purposes of granting options. So you got a tiny, maybe a small option plan, or maybe you had a good option or option pool, I should say, or maybe you had an option pool, but now you've gotten bigger, whatever. The VC wants to see you have at least a 20% post money option pool, but they don't want that to come out of their hides. They want it to come out of your hides. So you're gonna to have to increase the option pool pre-close so it equals usually 20% post-close. So maybe 30% pre, so it's 20% post. We'll go over the math in a later presentation. Just understand that VCs will not let you close and then increase the option plan later because they get diluted by that increase. If it happens before they close, you, the founders, get diluted. Um, there's nothing nefarious about that. We all know that's how it works. It's just the way it goes. Redemption rights, never see them. Don't have to talk about them. That's a right that the VC has to put their stock back to the company in a strategic deal you might, but rarely these days. Anti-dilution, I've just got a couple more. I know I'm running late, but I wanna get through this so I don't have to do a part two. Uh, Anti-dilution, uh, this is the idea that if the VC buys your stock at one price and you sell it later at a lower price, they're gonna get a little bit of an adjustment. Broad full ratchet means they get a full adjustment. They bought it for a dollar and you sell it later for $2, they get twice as many shares, okay? That's full ratchet. Never, almost never, rarely see that, uh, only in troubled companies. It's usually what we call broad-based weighted average, which I won't bore you with the math, but it, it's just industry standard and it gives them a little bit of a bump, but not that much. It mostly just drives us crazy trying to figure it out. Expect to be exclusive with your VC, uh, meaning that once you sign that term sheet, you don't go talk to anybody else uh, for 30 or 60 days. That's why I'd like you to have more than one term sheet at one time, because once you sign it, you're stuck. You're committed to negotiate that deal. And if you don't make a deal 30 days or 60 days from now, your other VCs might not be so interested in you. Uh, expect confidential, oh, the term sheet is non-binding, by the way. Um, but expect um, that the 30-day no shop will be binding. And also you'll have a, con a, a binding, hopefully a binding confidentiality clause. So nobody's out blabbing about your deal while you're trying to get it done. Okay, we're at the top of the hour. Um, I did not get through everything, but uh, I'm going to, I didn't talk about troubled company terms because nobody here is a troubled company. Um, but uh, we got through most of it. I want to call your attention to my reading list, which is at the back of the slides, which I will send to you. Read all of these books, starting with this one, all right? And then moving right along to this one, all available on Amazon. And um, there are some other ones that I've read that I like and most of my content, uh, well, not most of it, some of my more industry-related content comes from these books. So uh, feel free to read them and, uh, and enjoy. And again, that's who I am. If you'd like to know more about me, I'm Roger Royce. I'm a partner in the Emerging Growth and Venture Capital Group. I do tax and corporate law with Emerging Growth and Venture Capital companies in Silicon Valley and Palo Alto at the Hamwall 100 law firm of Haynes and Boone. And now with that, I am going to go ahead and open this up to questions. I can figure out how to stop my share. There we go. 
Okay, make sure to ask the questions uh, in the Q&A because I might not get to this chat again today. Okay, hold on. Let me go to the Q&A. Okay, is this presentation relevant to pre-seed stage startups? I probably should have answered that right at the start. Um, you know, it is, it absolutely is because you need to, you need to position your company appropriately for when you get to the venture capitalist. And like, for example, remember what I said, you don't sell common to raise money. That's something a pre-seed startup might want to know, because if you've done that, your cap table might be screwed up. It might be something that's hard to fix down the road. There's a lot of things like that. Um, you want your company to look a certain way. You want it to be a Delaware C corporation when you go talk to the VCs. Maybe you formed as an LLC because you're a pre-seed startup. Nothing wrong with that. Just make sure you convert when you go talk to the VCs. Um, and by the way, that can be easier. That can be difficult. It's a lot trickier than people usually think, especially as a tax matter. Question, how do first time founders figure out an appropriate valuation given that competitors may have valuations that are several multiples higher? By the way, let me uh, mark these as done. So good question. How do you figure out an appropriate valuation as a first time founder? It's not your job to figure out the valuation. You're not going to tell the VC what you're worth. He's going to tell, he or she, is, they are going to tell you what you are worth, okay? They are going to give you a term sheet. You're not gonna give them a term sheet. Their term sheet is gonna tell you that we think you're worth this. And remember what I said about valuation. How do they come up with that number, right? They'll use one of their formula. Usually it's the simple one that I told you. You need X, you need X dollars, they need Y percent. Z is your valuation. Now, once in a while, I've had this happen where, and usually with the smaller venture funds, they'll say, hey, what's your value? Um, and that's not something you should ever volunteer. This is negotiation 101. Right. This is never split the difference. Um, you don't go and and all and, and for, well, let me pause on this. So I see so many decks and so many term sheets that end with, and our valuation is X, or we're raising this much money at this valuation, or we're selling Y percent for this much money. Don't do that. Don't do that. If you're doing it, stop doing that because you create two problems. Number one, you tell sophisticated investors that you've never done this before right which is not a good luck even if it's true and um secondly you're just giving them a number to cut in half at least before they make an offer and that is exactly how it's been expressed to me by more than one professional venture capitalist right so you don't tell them evaluation i think you got the point now once in a while smaller funds they'll say gee um, what do you think your valuation is then at that point, you do have to give them a number, right? Now, you want to anchor, right? You want to anchor this. You don't want to give them too low, uh, but you don't want it to be so high that people are going to run away. So what do we do? Well, if you want to email me, because <laughs> my email is in the chat, I think it is, or otherwise find me on LinkedIn, I have a memo that has about 30 different ways that you can come up with valuations for early stage startups. These are not professional. I'm not a professional, I'm not a valuation professional, just 30 different simple, easy rule of thumb kind of things. And by the way, I write about them in my book and they're attached as an appendix to my book. Um, and what you should do is find three of those that converge on a number, get your spreadsheets out, you know, number of patents plus people times a million, you know, the, the method I sent to you, you know, the Berkus method, all these other methods, find three of them that converge on a number, put it in a spreadsheet and say, this is what I think we're worth and this is my backup for it. And that gives you a starting point and aim high, okay, aim high. All right, yes, we are going to be, our recording and you'll get a copy of the recording. Uh, repeat that again, the part of what type of shares to give to who. Okay, thank you. I know I talk fast because I always start off with 50 slides and get through half of them. 
So I will repeat that again. Your capital structure is made up of common stock and preferred stock. The preferred stock is what investors get. Preferred stock is called preferred because they get their money back first, right? Uh, unless they convert to common, which they might do if you're really successful. The common is the residuary. It gets what's left over after the preferences are paid. Common stock is just a pro rata percentage of the company. What type of shares to give to who? You give the common to the founders and service providers. You give the preferred to the investors. Why do we do it that way? Because the common stock we want to have priced really super cheap. And if you take into account the preferences, that should leave less residuary for the common, which gives you an artificially, and I don't mind, I'll just tell you, it is artificially low. It's artificially low, right? Because we value the common as if those preferred stock really have preferences. But in practice, they don't, because if things go well, the preferred is going to convert to common and they won't take their preferences, they'll take their pro rata percentage, right? And if things don't go well, none of this matters. So that's why I say the common is priced artificially low based on expectations. We wanna give cheap stock to founders and service providers because they have to pay for their stock or they have taxable income when they receive it. And we want both those numbers to be super low. We wanna give preferred stock to investors because we want them to have as little equity for as much cash as possible. So we want a higher price preferred stock. So again, um, more than 20 years ago, uh, we used to just use a rule of thumb. We used to say your preferred is worth 10 times your common because of the preferences. We did that whether it was participating or not participating, whether it was cap, whether it was uncapped, whether it had redemption rights, whether it had anything. We just said 10 to one. And we all held our noses and took that position and the accountants signed those tax returns uh, and the lawyers filed those statements with the SEC. You don't do that anymore. Now, um, uh, when people grant options anyway, they have professional valuations and we live and die by those valuations. I wanna talk a little bit more about valuation on that question, by the way, because this is, this is inside baseball, if there ever was. Um, here's a scenario. You're way pre -seed. You start at your company. It's just uh, two of you, we'll say. And you're a year into it. And now third founder comes along, some guy or girl or gal or they, with domain expertise, right? Domain expertise, very valuable to your company. Or maybe even another technical expertise person. So you need to bring them into the company. Right, oops, drop my phone. So how do we do that? Um, we wanna sell them stock. Well, you know, you, the two founders, when you formed a company, you pay what, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 cent per share for your stock. Can you sell this next person's stock at that really super low price? It's common stock. Remember what I said, it's the residuary. So, um, and the answer is it depends, right? The rule is service providers have to buy their stock at fair market value. And if they don't, they have to pay tax on the gain. And the gain is the difference between uh, what it's worth and what they pay for it. So what's it worth? Well, how early are you? So here's the thing, how far along have you come? And a lot of lawyers, they don't really pay enough attention to this. And the reason why is because the IRS is underfunded and doesn't audit this issue, right? In 40 years, I've seen it come up once and I've done lots and lots of startups, right? So sort of a crime in the street scenario where people get away with murder because they're not being audited. And I'm here to warn you, that's about to change. The IRS is about to get funding. It's gonna happen. Uh, Chuck Reddick is going to get that money that he needs to go after these issues any day now. And there's going to be a lot of bloody shirts because you have to sell that stock at fair market value. Now, having said that, what is commonly done is until that company does something, the CPAs will sign the returns and the lawyers will draft the documents uh, and everybody will close one eye and look the other day and just pretend that company is worth a nominal amount up until the time it does something big. I've seen companies take that position even after they have issued safes, as we talked about last week, right? Those are investments. 
And I've seen companies do that after they've done convertible debt. Uh, the only time you know for sure that you cannot do that is in two scenarios. One, if you get a 409A valuation, that's a stock option, professional valuation of your shares. Now you've got hard data that you can't ignore. Or number two, when you've sold common stock for a higher price. Now, I know theoretically you could say there was something else going on in a deal and you sold it for more than it's worth. Good luck with that. And I digressed, so let's move on. All right, VCs always ask about, um, I don't understand your question. Minimum for ARR, minimum for extra 1 million. You're gonna to have to you're gonna to have to add to that question and tell me what what you mean. I don't quite get it. I'd be able to scale with them, isn't it a paradox? Let's come back to that. What's the danger of using finders who are usually looking for a percentage of capital raise? Well, a couple of things. We used to do that all the time. This Silicon Valley used to be full of finders. Um, and that stopped uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was legal. Um, it's uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, the SEC, uh, requires, treats finders as broker dealers if they take a percentage of funds raised, what we call success-based compensation. If that's true, they have to be registered as a broker dealer, which is a very onerous obligation. Nobody wants to do that. So, so the danger is you might be using an unregistered finder. And if you're using an unregistered finder, two things, uh, you don't have to pay the finder. <laughs> number two, and you can get the money back if you have. And then number two, um, the investor has probably has a right of rescission because this has disqualified your securities exemption. So the company now have, would have to give the money back to the investor if they ask for it. And they might even be disqualified from raising money under that same technical, under that same securities exemption. So that's a real danger. So you would never do it. That's the legal aspect. Um, now, I know a lot of companies will get around that by not tying the compensation to the percentage of capital raised. And I see that all the time. Um, then the issue is really a market issue because you are telling the market, um, it kind of depends who the finder is a lot too, because you are telling the market that even in this market with all this money that you weren't able to uh, raise that money on your own, you had to go hire a professional. So be careful. I don't say, I'm not saying don't use finders, I'm saying be careful. Make sure you've got somebody reputable and don't, you know, don't get listed on a market for lemons, right? You know, find someone who's not going to break the law and who has credibility in the marketplace. Done. Okay. Oh, I got a lot of questions. Okay, let's see here, sorry. Would you recommend longer vesting for founder shares to avoid revesting at a later date? You know, okay, so the issue is, is that everybody vests over three years as a founder, and then you go to the VC and they say, that's great, you're fully vested. Now you're unvested if you want my money. So the question is, well, why not just start them at six years? Because it takes eight years at least to exit. That's average these days. Yeah, I got a company right now I'm working with. I formed them, formed them when my daughter was born. So that was 16 years ago. I'm not making this up. They just this week got their first Series A term sheet. You know, it's crazy what's going on out there. I, I really give it to them for hanging in there that long. Anyway, so the question is, why not just double the vesting period right from the start so we don't have to unvest? Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've just never seen anyone agree to that. That's all I can say about it. And it's not market. And, uh, you know, the Valley is efficient, if nothing else. And it's efficient about market. So that's a great idea, but I don't think anyone's going to do it. Uh, what are your thoughts on accelerators or incubators? Uh, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, I've seen some that have worked out really well. Uh, I've seen some that have done nothing but uh, waste time and money and take a bunch of equity for no value. So, you know, again, reputations are really important in the Valley. Uh, you know, 
email me directly. I'll tell you who I like, and I won't mention who I don't. How's that? You know, if you can't say something good about somebody or something like that. Um, if a company requires VC funding, at what point should they actually seek out funding? Should they have a product out? Um, um, you want to have traction to go to the VCs. And by traction, that usually means, yeah, that does mean that she, usually, usually you want to be able to show them that people are going to buy your product. They're going to pay money for your product. So it's hard to do that in beta, but not impossible. You know, if you can sell the dream, but yeah, the further are you are along, you are the better. Uh, ideally, you know, you would wait until you do have a product and you've got revenue traction before you talk to uh, a VC. But you know, VCs there's micro VCs now, angels with other people's money that will um, actually invest in these companies at much earlier stages. Uh, question is, hi Roger. The answer is hi back. Question is, can you go over the founder stock again? I, I think I just did actually, since the time you typed that question. The founder stock is the common that the founders get. It's the residuary. It's what gets issued right when you form the company. By the way, do that right away. Do not wait. Get that founder stock issued as soon as you possibly can, because that's when you can put vesting restrictions on that stock. If you wait and you have a founder dispute, your company is, do I have to say it? It's dead on arrival, right? No one will, will invest in a founder dispute. So get that common stock issued. No, don't, don't sit on that. I guess the do-it-yourself websites didn't tell you that part. If the firm is already incorporated outside Delaware, do we need to reincorporate? If you're going to a venture capitalist, yeah, you probably will need to do one of two things. A conversion where you basically file a one page, page piece of paper with the state of organization and the state of Delaware and poof, you're a Delaware corporation. Or if you're unlucky enough to have incorporated in California or a state like it, you'll have to do a little merger into a new Delaware corporation. Either way, yeah, they're gonna make you do that. And the longer you wait, the harder it gets because you'll have to change, you know, you'll have to change contracts, et cetera. Is there a replay? Yes, I'll be sending a replay. Um, I'm looking. Okay. How does. Uh, uh, oh, okay. A lot of good questions here. We're getting down to the end. So I want to. I want to. I want to cherry pick. Um, how to scale up your user base uh, without any funding and budget? Yeah, that's a tough one. That's not VC. That's angels. Go to angels. Sell them the dream. You know, your uncle. You know, take a little bit of money. Friends and family. You know, angels will invest in free traction. Not so much in my neighborhood because there's so many good deals that do have traction. But sell the dream. Take a little money. You know, then scale up. Show traction. Then you go to micro VCs and then maybe VCs. Um, what's next here? Thank you for this question. How common is royalty financing in Silicon Valley and in the US? Royalty financing, uh, also called SEALs, shared equity appreciation loans, uh, also called probably a lot of other acronyms. It's where you, the company, sell a revenue stream, right? So you're not giving up equity, you're giving up a revenue stream. So let's say you've got revenue, you've been you know, out there for a while, uh, you may or may not be a good fit for the VCs. Um, especially if you got cash flow. So instead what you'll do is they'll say, look, we've got this product. It you know, generates X dollars a year. If I get your money, we'll do more marketing and more manufacturing. We'll generate even more. And in exchange for your money, I'm gonna give you a percentage of the revenue. Maybe it's a percentage of the income, but usually a percentage of the revenue. Um, I have done that. I've done those deals. They're not common in Silicon Valley. They're way more common on the East Coast. And uh, I know up in the Northwest, there's an angel group that is doing a bunch of uh, royalty financing deals. And I like them because, especially for an angel, because typically you're waiting 10 years to get your return these days easily. I have companies I've invested in more than 20 years ago and I still get their statements every year. It's like, God, would you just die already? You know, just pull the plug. 
or sell or exit or do something. You're waiting a long time. With royalty financing, you don't have that problem, right? You get your money back immediately. Now you get less, I think, but it's a, I think it's just generally statistically, I think it works out less to what you would expect with a venture capital return, but it's a more certain return and it's sooner. So it's not as common, but I'm a big fan of it and I hope it becomes more common. Now keep in mind, if you do that and then go to a VC, the VC is going to view that as debt. In other words, it ranks ahead of them and it is going to affect your valuation. It just will. So just be aware of that. How is uh, vesting enforced? Yeah, the way that works, it's you sell the shares to the founder for their $10. And the way it's enforced is a company has a right that in a well-drafted agreement is automatically exercised with no further action by the company when the founder leaves. And under that right, those shares get sold back to the company at cost, which was nominal. That's how it's enforced. And uh, is there a template? Yeah, there is, but I'm not going to give it to you because um, people will no doubt get it wrong and then blame me. All right, a Delaware Dow versus a Wyoming Dow. Jeez, boy, these questions. Um, so I'm actually a big fan of the Dow as well. Um, and I'm very familiar with the Wyoming Dow statute. So what's a Dow? Decentralized Autonomous Organization. It's the idea that you have a group of people that instead of a centralized structure, they have a decentralized way of managing their organization. So they go out and make investments, code as law, you know, based on you know, their, their uh, group decision. Now, um, the idea of a decentralized management structure is fundamentally, in, those two things. One, that is fundamentally inconsistent with the idea of an LLC, which, the manager managed LLC, which has a manager. It's not inconsistent with a member managed LLC, which the members all have a role in management. So it fits the LLC model. And Wyoming figured this out and they enacted a Dow LLC where you basically, and why do you need an LLC? Why do you need to form this entity when we've got all this code that does everything that the entity would do anyway? Limited liability. And if you think that I'm kidding, I want you to know that just in the last week, there was a court case where the members of a DAO, an unincorporated DAO, were held jointly and severally personally liable for the debts of that operation, just as if there were a general partnership. This happened. There was a court case. It finally happened. I just saw it in the advance sheets the other day. That means you participate in a DAO. The DAO does something bad somebody gets hurt or financially injured, and that person who gets injured comes back and they manage to track you down uh, and say, look, you're a general partner, you have liability. So how do you stop that? You form your DAO as a limited, limited liability company, it means you can't be personally held liable, you know, subject to some exceptions that we're not gonna talk about here, right? Now, Wyoming has a statute that is designed exactly for that because Wyoming is right out there on the cutting edge. They're the opposite of California. They are, you know, enacting all this enabling legislation, allowing people the freedom to do what they want, freedom of contract, low regulation, sandboxes. California's approach, by the way, is exactly the opposite. It's just to regulate everything more. I hope people will do it. But I digress. Your question was, how about the Delaware LLC statute? Honestly, I hate to say it because I love Wyoming. I like to climb in the Tetons. I wear a cowboy hat. Um, and I think it's great that they're encouraging this. But honestly, I think you can do the same thing through a Delaware LLC. I think you always could. Um, so six of one, half dozen of the other to me. In fact, I probably prefer Delaware LLCs because Delaware is very clear that you can really minimize fiduciary obligations uh, to the max and not every state has that. And I honestly don't know about, uh, I know, um, I don't know how, how Wyoming's law is on that to tell you the truth. Okay. We only issued common stock when we formed our company, not preferred, is that an issue? No, you did that right. You didn't issue preferred because you had no preferred stockholders, right? You are going to amend your organizational documents when you get an investor to authorize and issue the preferred. 
when you get investors, not before. So you did that correctly. Okay, how difficult is it for you and US investors to invest in a German company? <clears throat> it's not that hard anymore. There was a time in this valley when it was forget it, we're not investing outside this valley. But here in the, the Zoom generation, investors will invest in foreign companies. I see that all the time. Um, okay, I've got time for one more question. So it's gotta be a good one. Um, oh, good, let's end on a tax question. Does issuing common stock trigger tax liability? Um, maybe. It doesn't if the person who it's issued to pays fair market value for the common stock. So when we form a company, there's nothing in it. It has nothing but a charter, right? So we sell the common stock for almost nothing, like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0001 cent a share, right? Because that's what it's worth. Problem is when you sell to service providers, employees, officers, directors, consultants, going forward, if that stock goes up in value and they pay that small price, they might have a tax taxable impact. But as I said, uh, people tend to go way out on a limb on that in terms of claiming that the company has no value. And you'll find a lot of investors who will back you up and say, it's not worth anything, I wouldn't give you a nickel. And my answer to that is, great, sell that stock to me for 0.0001 per share. I'll buy all you've got all day long. So anyway, there's some risk there is the answer, uh, but not very little to no risk on formation of the company. Okay, with that, we are at the end of my time. Uh, again, let me see, I'm gonna post one last time my information. Uh, feel free, you know, I'm gonna send you, make sure you, uh, oh shoot, let me, before I, I'm gonna give you my YouTube site. I'm gonna send you the link, but um, uh, I definitely would like you to come to the YouTube site. If I can find it. Right here. If you wanna see this presentation, as well as the last hundred of them we've done like it on various startup related topics. And uh, with that, uh, I wanna thank you for being here. You've been a good audience and we will see you next time.